Stereochemistry deals with the geometric orientation of bonds and different compounds within organic chemistry. And when you're dealing with stereochemistry, the first thing to be aware of is chirality. And chirality can be described as handedness. And the way that they describe it is that if you have a right hand and a left hand, they have the same components. They have four fingers and a thumb. But there's no way you can orient your right hand so that it perfectly overlaps with your left hand. There's no way to make them occupy the same space or be the exact same orientation. They will not fit together like that. And that's how chiral compounds work. A chiral compound has to have four different substituents. And these four different substituents can all rotate around their bonds and they can rotate and pivot in space. But what can't happen with a chiral compound is that there's no way that you can arrange them or rotate them so that they perfectly overlap. And that's what makes chiral compounds distinct. There's simply no way that you can rotate the bonds so that one chiral compound has the exact same orientation as its enantiomer, which is basically something that is the same type of atom with the same substituents, but it has a different chirality. And so for chiral carbons, you need to have four different substituents, and you can usually go down two or three atoms down the chain to find that. So for example, if you have a carbon that's attached to two other carbons, those aren't different, but if those two carbons are attached to other things, then you can consider those different substituents, and you can treat those as parts of a chiral compound. And so when you're dealing with chirality, the first thing to think is handedness and the fact that these cannot be superimposed. And that brings us to the topic of absolute configuration. Absolute configuration is something that's sort of a theoretical idea that we've come up with. It's a naming convention in order to describe different chiral compounds. And absolute configuration has two things. It's either going to be R or S. And R or S deal with the orientation of the different substituents around that chiral carbon. And so to find absolute configuration, the first thing that you do is you rank the substituents by their priority, with one being the greatest priority. And the way that you decide what has a greater priority is first by looking at the molecular weight. Whatever atom has the highest molecular weight will be the highest priority compound. And so, for example, in this one, we have bromine, which is a higher molecular weight than carbon or hydrogen, and so that will be the highest priority. So that would be what we would label as one. The second thing we do is if there is a tie, so if it has two substituents that have the same molecular weight, then you go to the next atom down. And so here we have this carbon that's attached to a carbon there, and this one attached to a carbon there. And so because that's a tie, there's a chance that if they're the exact same carbons that are bound to the exact same things, that they're actually not different substituents. But this one is because this one is attached to an alcohol group and two hydrogens, and this one here is double bound to an oxygen and a single hydrogen. And so if there's a tie, you go to the next atom. So we're looking at the carbon, and these two carbons are tied, so then we go to the next atom, which is an oxygen. And the final rule is that if you have a double bond, it counts as two separate bonds. And so here we have carbons. The first bond that we look at is oxygen. Both of them have a bond with oxygen. But this one has a double bond to oxygen. And the oxygen is a higher priority than hydrogen because it's a bigger molecular weight compound. And so we have a carbon here with two bonds to oxygen. So you count that as a carbon that is bound to two oxygens whereas this one is bound to only one and several hydrogens. So that would make this one the next highest priority. This would be priority number two here. And so we'll label that two because of those two bonds with oxygens rather than just the one bond here, making this one priority number three. And finally, our hydrogen here is number four. Whenever you see hydrogen, assume that that's priority four. The next thing that you do is you rotate this compound so that the lowest priority is in the back. 
And so what we want to do is we want to rotate it so that this hydrogen is facing away from us. And so you can kind of do it spatially, and if that's something you're good at, you can sort of envision in your head rotating the compound. And if we were to do that, then what we would end up seeing is we would have the COH over here, we would have the hydrogen now facing away from us, we'd have this C double bound to O group there, and we'd have the bromine like that. So just imagine this and twisting it around so that it's facing away from us. If you can do that sort of spatial rearrangement in your head, then that's a very good way to do it. Another thing that you can do is realize that if the hydrogen is facing you, if the hydrogen, the lowest priority substituent is facing toward you, you can just follow the opposite rules. And so I'll go through both ways to think about it. So essentially what you do is you rotate it so that the lowest priority is in the back, and then you trace from priority one to priority two to priority three. So we'll go from the bromine to this carbon to that oxygen, it's one, two, three, and notice that by doing that, uh, we have bromine to the C double bond O group to the C OH group. And this is one, two, three, and notice that those are rotating in a counterclockwise way. If it is counterclockwise, then this is described as an S carbon. Its absolute configuration is considered S, which means that when you go from first to second to third priority and you have the lowest ranking substituent facing away from you, if that's counterclockwise, you call it S. If it's clockwise, you're going to call it R. And so that's all you need to know. If something is labeled as S, basically what that tells you is that if the lowest ranking substituent is facing away from you, and you go from highest to next highest to the third highest substituent, if it's counterclockwise, then you consider it an S, and if it's clockwise, then you consider it R. However, there's another way to do it if the lowest, subs lowest substituent is facing toward you. You can just trace it the way that it is, and use the opposite rule. And so if the H is facing toward you, you would go one, two, three, and notice that that is moving us in a clockwise direction. And just realize that if this one's facing you and it's moving clockwise, that time we now call it S. And if the lowest priority one is facing you and you trace it counterclockwise, then that one we call R. So the way that these rules work are if the lowest priority one is facing away from you, if it's going into the page and going from priority one to two to three is clockwise, then that's going to be R and counterclockwise is S. If the lowest priority one is coming toward you and you go clockwise like that, then that will be S and counterclockwise will be R. So just the rules apply in the opposite direction if the lowest priority one is facing you. If you can, in your mind, spatially reorient this and just imagine rotating that compound, that's probably the best way to go. But if not, just realize that if the lowest priority one is facing you, then the rules are basically reversed. And that's a good way to think about chirality and labeling absolute configuration. One other thing to be aware of with chiral compounds is that they're very, very similar. Because they have the same substituents and the same types of bonds and things like that, a chiral compound and its opposite handed enantiomer will have the same boiling point, the same melting point, it will have the same molecular weight and a lot of things like that. But they differ in two very important regards. One is that they will rotate plane polarized light differently. So one, let's say the R form might rotate the light counterclockwise or clockwise, one of those two. And the S form, if you put that same light through it, would rotate it in the opposite direction. So that's one big distinction and it's a way we can differentiate two chiral compounds that are identical in every other way from each other. The second thing is that sometimes, for example, with enzymes and a lot of biomolecules, they will interact specifically based on their chirality. And so if there are, for example, chiral enzymes, then certain chiral compounds will interact well with those enzymes and certain ones won't. And this becomes important in physiology. But realize that if two things are identical compounds except for their chiral properties, the only differences will be that they rotate plane polarized light differently and they interact uh, 
perhaps differently with other chiral compounds. And so that's what you need to know about absolute configuration. And then we'll move into relative configuration and observed rotation in our next lessons.